Today's episode is brought to you by the Rosenfield Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. The collection exists as an online source for research and inspiration, featuring photos of thousands of objects made by over 800 artists. The images are high quality and can be used with no permission required, making them a great resource for students and teachers. To find out more, visit www.rosenfieldcollection.com. This episode of the podcast is also sponsored by Amico Brent. Hi, I'm Jake, purchasing agent at Amico, providing you with everything you need for clay. This episode is brought to you by Amico Brent. Find your favorite Amico glazes or Brent equipment at your local distributor. Cheers for listening. Happy glazing. My name is Kathy King, and welcome to the For Flux Sake podcast. I'm coming to you from the Harvard Ceramics Program in our fair city, Alston, Massachusetts. I'm here with Rose and Matt Katz of the world-famous Ceramic Materials Workshop, and they are ready to answer your burning questions about clay and glaze. Hey, Matt and Rose. Welcome back. Hey, Kathy. Hey, Kathy. Well, it has been advised to us from our producer to not (laughs) jab as much at the beginning of this episode. You guys talk too much. (laughs) Could you not talk so much? This podcast would be better with less talking. We we do take our own path at times, and we have so many amazing questions to cover today. So um, we're going to uh, get right to it. Um, so just right out of the gate, we have Katie, uh, and I have to note this because it's in the email, uh, name, but Katie of Waxing Gibbous Pottery, do a little shout out there, but I thought that was such a cool name from North Carolina is, uh, called in and asked a question about glazing. Howdy for flux sake, folks. I'm Katie in North Carolina, and I'm a glaze nerd and a big fan of the show. Recently, I was hastily glazing work to fire in my kiln before going out of town. I was wondering, what if I glaze my pots but then didn't fire them until after my trip? Would it affect the glaze outcome? I also teach at a community studio where glazed pots may sit unfired on a shelf for days, sometimes weeks if it's the gas kiln, waiting to be loaded in the kiln. I'm assuming this is fine, but wanted to get your expert opinion. Thanks! Great question. Wait, we're experts? <laughs> did, did we Look, not tell you that, Nobody told Rose? me that. Nobody that, told I me that. I did not say that. I don't know. <laughs> I think it's written down in your contract. <laughs> right, right. But anyway, right. a great question because, yeah. And we should turn it to you, Kathy. I mean, do you see, do your students see differences over time? No. No, no, no. no. Yeah, we have everything nice. from stuff going in the kiln wet to things, especially as as uh, Katie mentioned, the gas kiln and the soda kiln, especially, will take weeks and even up to a month to get fired at our studio. So, um, and and I will say too that when we closed for the pandemic, we of course you know, basically just uh, threw plastic over everything, and we fired it. You know, maybe I think it was like six months later when we had some we were yeah and it was all fine looked lovely that is a glaze test i would have wanted to see though oh Oh, that is some serious just that's a lot of time like i mean it is it is just for just for proof of concept well i mean could could something have been a little different that i didn't notice well there could be some stuff growing crystals but yeah you know some fuzzy stuff yeah, like, the the, you know. the major issue is that, and and that's generally going to come from from some soluble, generally sodium in our glazes, um, where uh, our feldspars that pretty much all glazes have feldspar, which are going to be the source of our alkali metals, lithium, sodium, potassium. 
they are theoretically not water soluble, but in reality, they're kind of a little bit water soluble. So they'll dissolve some sodium and then that can move to the surface and you might get stuff like carbon trapping or flashing on the surface if it aged for a really long time. The one glaze where that's really taken advantage of is, is Shino glazes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want those fuzzies, right? <laughs> <laughs> you do. Well, the Shino. It was the one time I didn't get any comments or complaints about the Shino. <laughs> so I guess <laughs> perhaps that worked. <laughs> uh, I mean, we can have a conversation about Shino people in there. But no. Shino people. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sh Shino glazes tend to use a ton of that sodium in most Shino recipes. If you ever mixed a Shino, you'll notice that they often have soda ash as an added ingredient. Soda ash is sodium carbonate, and that is very, very water soluble. And Shino people are using that on purpose. So when they mix the glaze with water, the sodium carbonate, which goes in as a powder, breaks down and dissolves, just like when you add table salt to water, right? It's, it's in solution, it is soluble. And so what can happen is that as the glaze dries, that soluble sodium will rise to the surface because it travels with the water and then the water evaporates, but the sodium can't evaporate into the atmosphere and you'll get sodium deposits on the surface. Surface. So sometimes Shino people will age their Shino pots to like let them sit. And as Rose says, they'll grow fuzz over time. And that can create this effect we call carbon trapping. Yeah. I remember when I was working in a, in a community studio and uh, I was loading the kilns. I remember one uh, other fellow uh, potter yelled at me because I touched his Shino after it was sitting on the shelf to load it. And I touched the crystal and he flipped out on me. I was like, Oh, I'm sorry. You know, that you shouldn't have glazed the whole thing. How am I going to put it in the kiln? He's like, you ruined it. I was like, Oh man, that was, yeah, that's something I won't forget. They're sense <laughs> sensitive people. She, you know, yeah. People. yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, that that's really interesting. I will ask our, um, staff member, Denny McLaughlin, who uh, fires our soda kiln, if, if he did note a difference after that, um, long period of time, yeah, but I'd like to know. I just remember it was surprisingly lovely out of the soda kiln so that you could have answered that. Yeah. I mean, I guess for, for Katie, going back to Katie, if, you know, a few days, I don't think will matter, but like a year, if it's sitting in the dusty studio, you probably want to like, you know, dust it off a little bit before you put it in the kiln, but otherwise it should be fine. I mean, the dust will even burn off. I, I, yeah, I that's you know, true. Most of our materials are rocks, right? We get them as these fine powders, but they are just rocks that are ground up really fine. And that's all they are. They're rocks. Rocks don't really change. They've been around for a long time and they don't change all that much. It's the question of, is there something soluble in that glaze? And that's where like the Shino stuff comes in. Yeah. All right. Well, our next question comes from another Katie from San Francisco, California. And this one I thought was a little bit spooky. We might be going into the realm of the paranormal. So. <laughs> Katie Petro in San Francisco, California, calling you with the question about pinging. Hi, Matt and Rose. I want to know why my coffee mugs won't stop pinging. The mugs in question have been fired twice. They were initially glazed with a studio glaze called Cranberry in cone six in oxidation or cone five in oxidation. And they bubbled to holy hell. So I dremeled the holes and filled them with saturation gold from Amico, knowing that it would be a little runny and they then refired them. Um, they've been on my table, uh, in a fairly uninsulated Victorian house for about a week and they are still pinging. They're pinging both in the morning when they get hit by the morning sunlight, but they also were just pinging as I was going to bed in about 55 degree heat. So can you tell me what gives, why would mugs that are a week out of the kiln still be pinging? Thank you. Well, they're obviously crying out for help. <laughs> <laughs> I would get a Morse code definition and start playing that back. I, I have to give my answer in the form of a song and I don't sing, but oh, good. ping, 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 
Wow. Oh. Was that necessary? Oh, yeah, it was yeah. necessary. It wasn't necessary. <laughs> I'm willing to embarrass myself. I'm okay with that. Yeah, you just did. Yeah. Ah, uh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> uh, we have small children. They tell us this every day. I, oh, I yeah, that's true. Water. <laughs> So under tension, but I mean that that's weird. Oh, well, I've there actually isn't. Yeah, um, no. Okay. I mean they they it, they can ping for quite a long time. There's some that can actually like it, it comes out of the kiln uncrazed, and then they can they have delayed crazing, and they'll start crazing like a month or a year down the road. They can craze, wow. and, and so yeah, it's just the matter of that. Uh, clay body and glaze fit and the tension and compression that it's in. Yeah. The, the, the thing to understand is that clay bodies and glazes have a compression tension relationship and that um, ceramics as a whole, both clay bodies and glazes are very, very strong under compression or pressure. So that, that they're perfectly fine. The place where ceramics become weak is under tension, which is a pulling force. And what often happens is that the difference in the, the expansion between the glaze and the clay body are different, and that creates tension generally on the glaze. And the glaze snaps, which is what we hear as a ping, and it also results in a craze. And so what you're hearing is crazy. And that's the thing that like most people, when they open their kiln and it's hot and they'll hear it go ping, 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 ping. And then they slam the lid down and freak out like, oh, I just made my work craze. And the answer is no, it was going to craze anyway. It's just that you hear it happening because it's in the cooling stages as they're going, as they're going down in their thermal expansion. Delayed crazing, delayed tension release is definitely a thing. And there's a lot of variables that go on. Like she's mentioned, she's layering two glazes. That puts a lot of stress, depending on how well fired the clay body is. She said she was fired at cone five, which is kind of under firing in general. I know they say cone five, six, but cone five is on the lower end, which means it's not as well fired. That means you can create tension. Um, uh, and so all those types of things go on. And yeah, it, it will it will keep happening. It could happen a year later. Wow. Where it's just, you know, it's just like family Thanksgiving. Everything starts out okay. And then the tension builds and then the tension builds and then the tension builds. And then Uncle Bob makes a comment about his brother's hair and then everything mm -hmm. just goes mm -hmm. crazy. Um, so yeah, it, it, it does happen. It's not unheard of. It's just delayed crazing. Wow. I did not know that. All right. All right. You learn <laughs> something new every day. All right. <laughs> so our next question, we're going to kind of switch gears now um, away from post uh, firing and go into the before land. And Stephanie has a question about their slab built pieces. Hello, Kathy Rosen, Matt. My question is concerning warping on slab built items. Am I getting warping from uneven drying, or is there such a thing as clay memory? I thought clay memory was an old potter's tale. Can you set me straight? Thank you. Love your show. Stephanie from Portland. Let me tell you. I, we <laughs> had a situation this week where uh, we have an online class called Experimental Photography on Clay, and this wonderful instructor, Ann Eater, is is I love teaching. Ann. She's oh, great. She's amazing. And so they're they're doing really experimental work with photo processes. And so we prep the tiles for the class, and they pick them up, or we mail them to them. And uh, I had one of my wonderful staff people, Amanda, start making about a hundred, over a hundred tiles for this class and man did this poor child have like six different people in the studio come up to give advice to tell them how to make these tiles that would not warp and it really is one of those things in clay that everybody has a different theory about and you know she mentioned uh clay memory and whether that's a old potter's myth or not so i'll shush but it's real the stroke. well let me give you my advice here <laughs> yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it, a clay memory is real it's definitely real it's just saying the words compression and tension it's a compression tension relationship in the way that the clay is is made and the way that the clay is processed um it's it's a long story that that's not totally you know worth getting into but it is real and um if you have if you have a copy of ceramic science for the potter um by Lawrence he he goes into it um, um, but yeah, it's, it's not, it's not, uh, not a thing, no matter how much we love stepping on those, those ceramic myths. 
Um, so you do have to watch out for it. As far as the slab, it's a little bit hard to diagnose because there's a lot, a lot of variables in there. And that's going to be the mm-hmm. tougher one. Um, a couple of things to watch out for, though. I mean, the first problem is the clay composition itself. No matter how much we trust that this is some great clay composition, it might not be, even if it's being sold. Um, and one of the things that we study a lot and talk about is the particle packing in the clay, which is clay is made up of a whole bunch of different materials and they need to fit together properly like a jigsaw puzzle. And if they don't, the clay can warp and crack and that can be a problem. So you have to watch out for that. The other ones though, is how well the clay was mixed. Again, don't have a lot of control over that, but you know, I definitely do, you know, recommend giving it a thorough wedge and trying to orient the slab into the slab roller based on that so that you're sort of working with all of that. My number one advice, and and y'all can contradict me, um, is uh, I think that people tend to make slabs the wrong way, which is, in, which is they'll sort of make their clay And then they'll just throw it on the slab roller. They're sort of wedged up and throw it on the slab roller and then just push the whole thing through and call Mm -hmm, it done. mm -hmm. I, I, I -hmm, cannot. mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's you need, if you've got a a traditional horizontal slab roller, I've never used one of the vertical ones. I don't really know how well they work. Yeah, I've never used the vertical ones either. Kathy, do you guys have one? No, those, I I thought those didn't catch on for some reason. (laughs) Everybody (laughs) stood looking at them, scratching their head. Like, well, what? (laughs) It's an interesting idea. It takes up less space, but I, it just seems tricky. Um, but what I always do with my slab is I will wedge it. I will pound it down as relatively flat as I can. A mallet's better than your hand, but you can use your hand like a big wide mallet. But what I do is I start with the slab roller as wide as open as possible. And I don't care if it barely makes a dent. I will start with it completely open. I'll roll it through. I will flip my clay over and then roll it again. And I will keep flipping and reducing and Mm -hmm, flipping and mm -hmm. reducing. Because if you put, if you just push it through, you're creating uneven uh, pressure on that slab and it's going to want to curl up when it comes out the other side. And changing that orientation and flipping it. Like I don't use a slab roller at all, but I think the biggest um, uh, slab I'm using in my studio might be like 30 by 30. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, just get it onto drywall and my and just compress the hell out of it at you know with a rib um many times and then my thing is i just try never to bend it again (laughs) (laughs) if i I can avoid it now i'm working with tile work so it's not i'm not making a cylindrical hand-built piece but um to get like a really flat tile i just sandwich everything so if it's if i've got to flip it then i'm flipping it by sandwiching it between like two bats or two boards and flipping the entire thing. Mm -hmm. But Rose, you must have (laughs) a tip or two. She probably forgets, but we use, she used to make huge slabs and and build off of them. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, yeah. Compressing it and switching the orientation. If you're using the slab roller, it was definitely my trick, but in, in industry for tile, when it's extruded, it's, it's basically the extruder is engineered. So it breaks up the clay and then it smushes it one way and then another way. And then it comes out and it has to slightly curl up to go down and then you cut it and then it's got a dry specific way. And then a certain amount of window. So it's, it's like a whole different beast in in industry, but yeah, if you're hand building, yeah, definitely compress it, switch orientations and just compress it, compress it, compress it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you have a strong feeling about what kind of boards you use? Cause that's always like a hot topic in the studio, whether drywall or the tile boards or Yeah, I don't like I I'm not a fan of flexible boards, especially with working slabs like drywall is ideal, too, because it sucks that like doesn't keep moisture underneath it. So it's got a possibility of dry drying more evenly. But, um, you know, plastic, you know, and the canvas, like if you like um, 
they the slab roller that oh gosh the last one i used had like you had to make an envelope of canvas and then you move it over to your board yeah I hated we that. use that yeah yeah so well like, what we do we have that for different clay bodies or so you know like we, we have one for brown but what we did to get rid of the canvas uh is to buy uh pellon at the What's at Pelon? like Joanne's fabric, it's interfacing, oh. and so it's this white material that you would it, or a stabilizer that you know uh, people would sew into say like a behind the cloth of a quilt or something in a jacket. And so they have uh, the many kinds are fusible, so there's like an adhesive on it already oh. that uh, is heat activated. But if you can get it, uh, not and you can uh, without the. Uh, glue on it essentially um it's fantastic and it's it leaves your slab super smooth and we just put that between the clay and the can uh the canvas so we get rid of that texture oh my gosh and, i mm -hmm. have this is taking me back i have i have canvas texture trauma oh <laughs> me too i hate oh my god pet peeve I had a teacher who would scream at the class like mommy dearest with the wire hangers no canvas texture you will fail was that me? No, no, okay. no, no. <laughs> But so now I'm like, yeah. I'm like, get rid of your canvas texture. Get rid of it. Totally. But that's, I need that now. Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. that's hilarious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So let's see if we can squeeze in one more question. Uh, and this question comes from Passion from Webster, Texas. And Passion asks, uh, and I should note that Passion is a ceramic tech at a local university. Uh, and the question is, why is my clay body that I've been mixing the same way for years without problem short? Mm. So they're mixing large amounts um, at school and they've been doing it the same way for a long time. And all of a sudden it's short. Well, what materials are you using and mm. what's changed? Well, we should also say what, you know, just for anyone who doesn't know what short is so that, you know, when you do that little coil test and you bend it to see what the, how plastic the clay is, if it breaks, uh, that would be an indicator that it's short. Yes. Yeah. Or if you like, yeah, bend it and it breaks apart instead of shaping to that curve that you want. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it really does depend on what's in there. And that becomes hard to say. Now, I will say that that Passion said in the notes that they were also adding reclaim into the clay, which is generally an okay thing. But we were talking about how sodium can kind of dissolve and say they're using uh, either a sodium-based feldspar like minspar or nepheline cyanite. Um, those have sodium in them and that sodium can make your clay very, very short. Theoretically, theoretically, all clay bodies should use potassium feldspars, um, potassium kalium feldspars like Custer or G200EU, um, uh, because that doesn't make clay short, but sodium definitely can. So that's definitely something to watch out for with, with those. Um, but yeah, the rest of the materials, I mean, materials change over time. So we'd have to know exactly what it is. Um, sometimes materials get better. One of the crazier stories over the last couple of years is tile six, which is a pretty common clay over here. Um, it was, it was an okay clay, but like in the last like five, 10 years, it got like amazingly good. Um, and I contacted the company <laughs> and they swear nothing has changed. Um, uh, but no, like it distinctly got better. Cause it's so Where funny. Did I did you can... notice that it was being its best clay self. It, so uh, we teach a class on clay bodies. And what happens is we have people start with testing, just making a clay body out of an individual clay. So they'll make one body that uses EPK and they'll use one that uses tile six and they'll use one that uses Grawlig or something like that. And, and, and then we have them like report back, like give it a grade, like give it a, you know, a one out of 10. And historically like tile six would get like a four, like it was fine, but it wasn't great. And then five or six years ago, all of a sudden people were saying this tile six is not just okay. I love this clay. Like it is wow. like my favorite clay body and I'm not even adding in any of the other materials. Yeah. But on the other hand, the slip casting well, then, you know, version of problem. tile six went to crap. <laughs> 
Yes. Oh, really? Okay. That was the other part is our consulting clients started mentioning how their casting slips were turning to jelly. Yeah. And we were able to correlate that to tile six changing, being in the clays and then changing bag color. So tile six used to be in a brown bag with green text. And then the company got sold and now it's in a white bag with red text. Um, And I contacted the company and they swear nothing changed, but like the clay got more plastic for working use and then got work worse for slip casting. The slip casting issue has actually kind of gone away in the intervening five or six years. It's now, it's now slip castable again, but those plastic, like people love working with a body. That's just tile six. I'm not saying it's a great clay body. I do not advocate mm-hmm. just tile six as your clay, <laughs> but it definitely went from a thing where people would give it like fours to people would give it like nines. Um, and, but so clays can get better and they can get worse. Um, so that definitely happens. There's other stuff, you know, passion saying that they're working at cone 10. So it probably eliminates talc from being in that body, but many of you know what's going on to the talc issues these days. We've talked about it. Um, but a lot of clay bodies are using talc and a lot of clays are getting noticeably worse. A lot of people are complaining about certain clays online and they usually contain the talc. Um, so yeah, the talc, fun, the talc, <laughs> the talc. I mean, we've talked about it before. I don't want to go over it again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow. Well, Passion, maybe uh, sending us a note. Let us know what the actual recipe is. It'd be, you know, interesting to um, see if we can identify the culprit. But and I would say that in general for folks when they're when they're messaging us, two things: one, send us audio messages. The texts are okay, but we love getting your audio messages. And two, if you're sending something and you have a recipe, send it along. It does help us diagnose what's going on. Yeah, and I love to hear people's voices. So mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Except for mine. She's made that yeah, abundantly exactly. clear. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's exhausting <laughs> reading these texts. I can't. I refuse to be treated like this. Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, we better rest up then, Matt and Rose. And that is all we can fit into this episode today. So until I see you next time. Thanks, Kathy. See you again, Kathy. Well, folks, that's it for this week's episode of For Flux Sake. I'd like to thank the listeners who submitted questions this week. And if you want your question answered on the show, shoot us an email at forfluxsakepodcast at gmail.com. So join us next time. And when in your studio, remember what Rose always says. Always remember to test, test, test. This is a test of the emergency glaze system. Beep. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org. Him. <laughs> <laughs> me, 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 me. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>